I want to preach to you for a little while this morning about the cows. That's my subject, the cows. If you have your Bible, you can open it with me to the book of First Samuel. Um, they turned it to me early, which I'm glad, because I will preach a little while today. We will still get out at our regular 2 p.m. time. <laughs> uh, I'm sure we'll get out earlier than that. But there's one good thing about the Rock Church. You get tired, you want to go home, just get up and leave. Uh, because we all just going to go on and do, you know, whatever. We're going to love God. And, and uh, uh, I don't think it's going to be that long this morning, but... You know, if you have to do it, man's got to do what he's got to do. First Samuel chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. First Samuel chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. And the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners, saying, What shall we do to the ark of the Lord? Tell us wherewith we shall send it to his place. And this is what the diviners and the priests, heathen priests, told them to do. Verse 7. Now therefore make a new cart and take two milch kine. That's old English language for two cows who have calves, who are nursing calves. Take two milch kine, on which there hath come no yoke, and tie the kine to the cart. The kine is cows. Tie the cows to the cart, and bring their calves home from them. And take the ark of the Lord, and lay it upon the cart, and put the jewels of gold which he returned for a trespass offering in a box or a coffer by the side thereof, and send it away, that it may go, and see if it goeth up, verse 9, see if it goeth up by the way of his own coast to Beth Shemesh. Then he hath, uh, then God of the God of Israel hath done us this great evil. But if not, then we shall know that it is not God's hand that smote us. It was a chance that happened to us. The men did so and took two milch kine, two milk cows with calves, and tied them to the cart and shut up their calves at home. And they laid the ark of the Lord upon the cart and the coffer with the mice of gold and the images of the rimrods. And the cows of the kine took the straight way to the way. Verse 12 is, is our text. And the kine or cows took the straight way to the way of Beshemesh took the straight way to the way of Beshemesh and went along the highway lowing as they went and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left and the lords of the Philistines went after them unto the border of Beshemesh and they of Beshemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley and they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it and the cart came into the field of Joshua, a Bethshemite, and stood there where there was a great stone, and they clave the wood of the cart and offered the cows a burnt offering unto the Lord. Let me take just about 20 seconds here to outline for you that Israel, who had the ark of the Lord, which was a box about so big that represented the glory of God, the Mahaney preached about it last Monday night, they had went into battle with the Philistines, their perennial enemies, and they had lost the ark. They had taken it to battle with them, and they had lost the ark. The Philistines had captured it, and in a taunting and um, gloating way, had taken the ark back to their cities. Well, the glory of God didn't fit among heathen that don't know God, and therefore uh, it brought judgment, and they got very sick. There was a plague on the land, and uh, so they tried to figure out, how do we get rid of this thing? How do we ri get rid of this representative box of the glory of God? And what we read was the instruction of their priest. 
get these milk cows and hook them to a cart and send it back. And we just read how it came back to an Israeli city of Beth Shemesh. And um, uh, when it got there, uh, they rejoiced and they killed the cows and broke up the cart, made a fire, and sacrificed them in thanksgiving to God. Um, I want to preach to you a little while this morning. It's a number of things here we want to look at. Let's. Uh, would you pray with me? If, if there's if there's a New Year's uh, if there's a New Year's message, this is it. I just want to preach to you a little while this morning. Uh, a focus towards 1997. Would you pray that God will touch us in the next few minutes? God, it's always worthwhile to come into Your presence and into Your house and to be with Your people. And we thank You for the blessings we've already received through worship and singing oh god and making melody in our hearts with thanksgiving we thank you for what you've already done and the privilege of your lord to worship you in our giving we're praying especially this morning god for a, a special touch and unction and anointing to rest upon us as a people today to know the mind of the spirit and the will of god and to see the glory of God manifested in our midst in the name of Jesus. Before you're seated, shake hands with a couple of people and be friendly this morning and gracious. Greet them in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. Let me take just a moment to say that um, I hope before I get through today I'll be able to exemplify to you a, uh, this is kind of a side note, a kind of preaching that we don't often hear uh, in Pentecost or probably anywhere um, because it, it, it always requires so much to get to where it's possible to do that. Most of the preaching that we hear in church is what we would call analytic preaching, uh, simply meaning that we will take a verse of Scripture and we'll analyze it and see what it has to say and break down all of its component parts. Sometimes uh, the preacher will go to the original languages and and, uh, break it down even further uh, and give us what God is trying to say. It is a drive for the literal in every verse. It is um, um, what we usually hear in our, or what we often hear in our preaching, whether it's Pentecostal church or another uh, kind of church. It's still, uh, most of it is analytic preaching. In our case, this is partly because we're a people that's concerned with doctrine. And doctrine, you have to, you have to analyze what it's saying to try to get to some semblance of literality, to, to the literal meaning. What is this? What is God saying to us? And how uh, absolute can we place our hopes upon it? Another reason that most of our preaching is somewhat analytic is because most of our preachers study uh, commentaries that were written in the 1800s. And the reason they study them is because those preachers in the 1800s literally did nothing except study the Bible virtually all day long. And uh, they had tremendous insights. And, um, and secondly, because they believed the Bible to be true, which when you read later writers in our uh, century, the 1900s, you find sometimes writers that are suspect because they don't believe that the Bible is true. And if you were to ask most Pentecostal preachers uh, what their favorite books were in terms of study, you would find them going back, and not only Pentecostal, many others that are Bible believers, going back to the 1800s to find those books because they are such of such high quality in terms of um, analyzing what the Scripture has to say and breaking it down for us. And I suppose the third reason that most people preach analytically is because it's the most natural way that comes to mind. In other words, when you open your Bible and you start reading... The very first thing you say is, what does it mean, this verse, and how does this verse relate to verses above it and beneath it? This is what they taught us to do. And um, what's the context of it? 
And there's a little saying that all preachers know, if they don't, they ought to, which says a text without the context is a pretext. Because uh, you have to look at the context to analyze it and see what the Scripture is actually saying. And so you can see here that this kind of analysis is essential. When we're preaching the Word of God, it's essential to look at it and to analyze it and to go back and look at the original language and to look at the context and to look at the history and to look at the parts. Um, And so most of our preaching is that way, not all of it. The other kind of preaching is what we would call, it's what I want to do this morning before I get through, is uh, what we would call a synthesis. You don't have to remember all these words. But once uh, a verse of Scripture is broken down and then it's put all back together, you didn't know all this went on, did you? You just thought we got up and preached. Um, once um, all of it is broke down, then, then you've got to put it back together. And then when you put it back together, if you're, if you're looking for a synthesis, you are looking at the whole spectrum of a book of the Bible or maybe a whole section of the Bible. And you're saying, is there a way that all of these multiple stories that the Bible is telling, is there a way that they come together? Is there a way that all of these are going to talk to us in unexpected ways? Now, you, you, will, you will appreciate your Bible better if you get a little understanding of what I'm saying this morning. And I'm fully aware that I'm starting on a little bit of an intellectual level today, which I know for some of us is quite a struggle Nevertheless, it's not a struggle because we're not able to accept it and receive it. It's a struggle because we're lazy. And so today we don't want to be lazy. We're going to learn a little bit. We're going to crank our brains up a little bit and get in the Word of God and uh, understand that you can receive a lot of things from the Bible just by opening it and reading it for the good things that it gives you. However, there's a lot of things in the Word of God. We're going to look at some of them today that are only seen after you've already read all of those stories. This is why you don't hear much of this kind of preaching. Because first you have to read all those stories. And you've got to reread all those stories. And you've got to re re reread all those stories. And you've got to four rereads. And you've got to five. And after, after a while, you've read through this enough until you begin to see that there's a bigger pattern that is emerging, that is trying to talk to us. And sometimes the remarkable thing is, is that... The, the stories that talk to us and makes the rest of it make sense are the least uh, seemingly important stories in the whole section. And what you discover in this, is this making any sense to anybody? All right, four of you have got it, I feel better. Um, what you discover in this is that not only does the Bible write down things for us to know, But the way that they are written is written that we can gain even further knowledge. That's why the Bible's inexhaustible. Let me digress just a moment to say that there is no book. It doesn't matter if it's Bible scholars that believe the Bible or if it's it's, uh, heathen scholars that just appreciate fine writing. There is no book that does this like the Bible because the Bible has a holy inspiration to it. And scholars who have studied these kinds of things say that there's stories in the Bible that interconnect, that the writer did not even, when he wrote it, he was not even conscious that these stories interconnected. He didn't even know that these stories, they said there's no way, they don't believe there's any way that a writer could have written and known how all of those stories were going to interlock together when he actually wrote what he wrote. And, of course, they would say, what a remarkable coincidence. We would say, what a wonderful way that it's inspired of the Holy Ghost. That God has put together the Word of God to teach us some tremendously important things and to bring us to an understanding that we could not have any other way. And so, when you look at these, there's ways that when you look at the whole thing, you see the Bible is talking to you. Now, I'm going to take about another five minutes or so, uh, ten minutes maybe, and give you a couple simple examples of this. This is all prelude to what I'm going to preach, but I want you to, don't want you to be ignorant. We, 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 this is the, where we do the Bible thing. And so uh, we're going to know more about the Bible when we get through this morning. Let me give you an example of this, a simple example of this. Um, when you look in the Bible, most all of the stories of the Bible are written with an extremely high degree of economy of words. The Bible stories are very lean. There's very little embellishment in Bible stories. This is why 
the Bible can tell some of its most powerful stories in two or three verses. You can read the story of the Good Samaritan, which is loaded with all kinds of meaning that goes all the way back to creation of man and the fall. Uh, and you can read it in three or four verses, or whatever it is, six verses, uh, because there's an economy of words. Therefore, when you read all of these stories, and you're reading along sometime, and you discover, hmm, this story has extra detail, then by reading all the stories and knowing how lean they are written, when you find one that has extra detail, you know that the extra detail has some kind of meaning, probably, that you're going to have to stop and, and, and think about a little bit to figure out why the Holy Ghost put some extra detail in that particular story when the normal way is that there is not extra detail in the story. An example of this is that the Bible spends so much time in the story of um, um, Goliath. Let me just give you an example. Uh, in talking about his clothing. When you, when you read the Bible, you'll find that when it describes its characters, it virtually never talks about what they wore. Now, Red Book would, I suppose, and, uh, and uh, uh, People Magazine would talk about what they wore. In fact, People Magazine wouldn't talk about what kind of person they were, just talk about what they wore. Uh, five pages on what they wore. And uh, one paragraph, maybe, on who they are. Uh, but the Bible is just the opposite. It deals in the heavy side instead of the light side. So when you come to the story of Goliath and you read where it talks about all that he had and all of his armor and everything that he had put on himself, and then you read about Saul and, and all of the armor, and then you see how none of it would fit David, immediately you see here that the writer is writing about Goliath, putting all this stuff about his clothes in there, and talking about Saul's armor, because he's getting ready to contrast that with David, and how that David couldn't wear any of those things, but his dependency was upon the Lord. That's just in a couple of stories of Goliath and David. Now, all of these stories that I'm picking this morning are out of 1 Samuel, because uh, you could get this anywhere in the Bible, perhaps, but, but it gets too heavy, too much. So I'm picking all these out of 1 Samuel. Goliath and David are in 1 Samuel. The story of the cows is in 1 Samuel. Uh, the story of Samuel is in 1 Samuel. And uh, basically that's what the book of 1 Samuel is about. Uh, sometimes the Scripture will keep adding some strange detail to stories. And you can't figure out why the Scripture keeps emphasizing that particular strange detail. Uh, and it will happen in this story. That does not relate particularly with this story. And it will happen in this story that does not relate particularly with this story. But in all those stories, when you read them enough times, you'll find out that this detail is emphasized in this story. This, this detail is emphasized in this story. And this detail is emphasized in this. Why is the writer emphasizing this particular detail? I'll give you an example of that. An example of that is that you find in 1 Samuel chapter 9 and 2, that it talks about Saul and how tall that he is. Then when you're reading along in chapter uh, 1023, it mentions again how tall Saul is. That he is indeed head and shoulders above everybody else. Then that when you get out of the story of Saul and you read on down in chapter 16, verses 6 and 7, you read down where Samuel is getting ready to anoint a new king, and he's looking at all the sons of, of Jesse, of which David is the youngest, uh, and his first anointing, he thinks, is going to be upon the oldest son, which is Eliab, and the Bible makes a point that Eliab is again a man that is big, a man that is tall, a man that is robust. Eliab has nothing to do with Saul directly, and yet here you are with these stories that are not connected that are putting together this idea of tallness, that here's Saul, and he's tall, and then here's Eliab, and he's tall. And then you just go another chapter, and you have the story of Goliath in chapter 17, and the very first things that it says about Goliath in verse 4 is that he was nine foot, six inches to 13 feet tall. Tall Saul. Everybody said tall Saul. And tall Eliab, and tall Goliath. 
All of them are tall. And there is the idea here that power is associated with being tall. That being a king or a leader or a champion is associated with being tall. And all of these are tall. Eliab is the big brother, and he's tall. Saul is the first king, and he's tall. Goliath is the great enemy champion of all those soldiers, and he's tall. And then you find David. And so what the Scripture is telling us, and David is not tall, and David defeats all of these people. He defeats Saul by becoming the next king. He defeats his older brother by becoming the next king. And he defeats Goliath in war. And what, he is, what God is saying, does tallness matter in terms of being a king? The answer to that, you may think, is no. But that's not true. The answer to that is yes. Tallness does matter in being a king. But it's not tallness physically. It's tallness of what kind of person you really are inside. I'm only teaching right now these little things so you'll understand where I'm going. All right, and so these are these are ways. If I was going to get real classroomy today, I would say these are ways in which the writer gives thematic impetus to certain ideas. In this case, tallness, and and the, he reinforces the idea that you don't have to be tall to be great for God by intersecting the story of Saul with the story of Goliath. And bringing them together. And at that intersection, your consciousness comes alive that all these people are tall. And it makes David even greater when you recognize that he is but a lad. But is, is David tall also? Ask your neighbor, is David tall also? Of course he is. He's simply tall in a different way. He's not tall according to physical stature. But he's got a tallness that is more important than tallness in physical stature. He has tallness of character. He has tallness of faith. He has tallness of courage. He has tallness of resoluteness. He has tallness of anger, if you please, when he says, I'm not putting up with this. He's tall where tall matters. But the writer's making a big issue out of tall in all of that. Now, I'm not making a big issue out of it. That's just a simple introductory example of how you pick up meanings in the Scripture through a synthesis of a number of stories that you cannot find if you just take the stories and break them into parts one at a time. So you have to do both, and, and we do try to do both. But here we're going to see in the story of the cows that there is a synthesis that is very, very real and that is very remarkable for you and I to look at and to observe this morning. The text that I read to you in the story of the cows uh, is, is, is such a story. It is a story which becomes uh, a springboard. It becomes, it becomes the key to the whole book of 1 Samuel. And, as I hope you see today, before we get through, it becomes the key for you and I in 1997. It becomes a key for us to understand things that are absolutely imperative for us to know if we are going to be effective in what we're trying to do. I already told you that in the story, the Philistines took the ark and it caused chaos for them. They did not know what to do with it. They got very sick. Uh, a plague came to them and uh, their mice overran the land and they physically got sick with emrods. People aren't quite sure what emrods are, but I got a good idea. Uh, they're not good, whatever they are. Uh, you would use preparation E on emrods. <laughs> Hallelujah. And um, the Philistines were quite discomfited with the situation that they found themselves in. And so as a result of this discomfort, it finally dawned on them they would take this ark from city to city, and every city they went to got struck with these emrods, and also got struck with the plague of mice. And it was probably all connected together to some kind of disease that mice were carrying, that uh, also the emrods may have been boils, like on the body, that came from uh, uncleanness of some kind. And usually with the mice, that's the connection. Or, or they use mice here. Uh, it was very possibly also rats uh, that they were affected with. And so after a little while, 
the, the people, it dawned on them that everywhere this ark goes, we have these problems. And so they went to the priest and they said, what do we do? They were heathens. They didn't know the real true God. Um, this is a weird story if you really want to know the truth. It, 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 and it gets weirder, the, more weird. Which is it? Uh, until it ends up weirdest uh, after a while. The, the, the priest said, look, what we got to do, we have got a hold of some dangerous material here that if we don't get it out of here, it looks like it's going to destroy us and none of us are going to be able to sit down. And so... We're, we're, going, we're going to have to do something here to alleviate this ongoing problem. And so they determined, uh, as they stood around and discussed this, they did... A few of you are awake. They, they uh, as they slowly walked around and carefully discussed the subject, they determined that something was going to have to be done. All right? And um, so they said, here's what we're going to do. They said, we determined that you ought to take these two milk cows that have calves, and um, you ought to put, you ought to put uh, a cart behind them and put the Ark of the Covenant on it and make some peace offerings out of gold. And the reason they made them in the form of rats and the form of emeralds and boils is because that was what they had been struck with. And it was a way of them saying in their heathen way, here's a peace offering. We apparently have trespassed. Please stop. Stop. And then uh, the priest, by, by indicating that these two cows should be cows that had calves, that were nursing their calves, this was a test that they were going to use to determine whether or not God had struck them with this. I'm not quite sure when I read this story why it matters whether God struck them or something else as long as they can get over it. But... They said, we will know that it is their God that has is, that is judged us uh, if these two milk cows that we hook to this cart uh, go down the road to Israel when we've got their calves behind them, because that's not natural. And uh, so the Bible tells us that that's what they did. And then the Bible says, and let me read it to you. Here's some analytic. I'm analyzing the story of the cows before we synthesize the whole section. Everybody understand what I'm doing? All right. And so, here's what in the original it would say exactly. I am reading from the original verse 12 of chapter 6. You can follow along in your Bible if you'd like to, and it will show you how uh, close that it is. Uh, here it is. It says, And the cows went straight on the road, on the road to Beth Shemesh, on a single high road, Lowing as they went, veering neither right nor left. Here it is again. And the cows went straight on the road, on the road to Beth Shemesh, on a single high road, lowing as they went, veering neither right nor left. Now, of course, the reason that the Bible reemphasizes that and is redundant in saying explicitly that the cows did not veer to the right and did not veer to the left and went straight on the road and went straight on the high road and went straight to the city Bethshemesh. The first reason is, is because this story has a particular meaning for the Philistines. And the meaning is, is that if the cows go straight down the road and don't in fact turn and fight against the harness to go back to their calves, then this is indeed a sign that there is a divine something going on that is preventing these calves from going back to where these cows to going back to where their calves are. And therefore, because that would be supernatural, we will know that God is involved in this. Of course, there was meaning to the Israelites. The meaning to them was, and we read it, that when the ark came back, it was a sign that the glory was returning to Israel. The symbol of the glory was coming back and that God was indeed with them. The Bible says they rejoiced because they had this knowledge that God was coming back uh, to Israel and was going to bless them. And if you read the story of the return of the ark to Israel, uh, after a while it ended up to be a tremendous blessing. And this begins the scenario that led to David taking the ark back to Mount Zion that you read later on in the Bible. <clears throat> so they knew it was going to be a blessing to them. However, this morning my intent is not just to teach you about analyses and syntheses. My intent obviously is not just to give you examples of this. Uh, nor is it to tell you what that meant to the Philistines 
and what that meant to Israel. Uh, my intent is, and the intent of the Spirit, and the intent of the writer of the Bible, the intent of God Himself, if you please, is what does this mean for us? And it means for us much, much more than what it uh, so far has revealed to us. There is a meaning to this story of the cows that is very important to us. So let's do a little more analysis before we get into synthesis. Let's look a little closer at this story. If you look in your Bible a little closer, you will find along about verse 7 of chapter 6 that these were cows uh, that had before this time been free to graze uh, and to determine their own destiny. They were cows, the Bible says, upon which uh, there had come no yoke. There was nothing, they knew nothing about bringing their natural fears and urges under the control of purpose. These were cows that had never known a yoke. There had never been a yoke upon them. They were, they were cows that had been free to determine their own destiny. They had been free to graze wherever they want to graze, to go when they wanted to go within the confines of the pasture and to come when they wanted to come. They'd never known what restraint was. Uh, they had no idea that any time you are hooked to a purpose, you automatically experience restraints. Because these cows had never known that, the story becomes even more remarkable. They were cows also, as we have seen, by virtue of the fact that they were called two milch kine, meaning that they were cows with calves. They were cows that, uh, I, I don't know how you would say this about an animal, but in an animal's life, I guess there are some tender moments, uh, but there could be no more tender moment in the life of an animal than the birth of their calf and the nursing of their calf. And so you find these cows, this 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 seemingly innocuous story, the story that seemingly doesn't have a lot of meaning, you find all this detail just stuffed into it by the writer. And he talks about the fact that these cows are, are cows that are, are, are in a time of tremendous focus upon that which they love the most. Uh, it is a time of tremendous concern about that which means the most to them. That is, of course, their own calves. Uh, but while they have their calves, uh, and while they are concerned about their newborn calves, uh, and while they are cows upon which there hath come no yoke, they are untrained cows. They are unbroken cows. Uh, the, these are the cows that the writer tells us is given a divine mission, and a mission that never before has there been such a mission placed upon a cow. These cows uh, do not understand anything about how it is to be in a harness. Uh, in fact, if you look closely, you will see when it's saying there hath come no yoke upon them, it means that they never had a harness on them. They did not know what it felt like. If you've ever broke uh, uh, horses or watched people break horses, uh, you will know what it's like, uh, uh, how they start, preferably when they're just colts, uh, uh, just rubbing their hand over them and then eventually, after a few days, he'll throw a blanket on him, and how uh, how unnatural that is to that colt, and how he'll throw it off, and how he'll reject that until uh, finally there's a process of get him, getting them used to that and training, and then uh, to, to put a halter uh, on him. And uh, eventually, a halter doesn't necessarily have a bit. A halter just fits over his head in such a way that you can lead him. The halter's first, and, and uh, some of you horse people will know more about this than I do, but then eventually they learn how to go from a halter to taking a bit in their mouth, and the harness goes on, and, uh, and, it's, uh, and there's more controls involved. All of that's a tremendous amount of training. Believe it or not, at one time uh, I owned a, a show horse. Uh, I owned half of him. Somebody else owned the other half. Um, uh, he owned a whole bunch of them. He was a pastor. He was an older pastor, and, and uh, he was in Missouri, and he loved horses, and he had a bunch of them. And uh, he said, why don't you buy half of this horse? And I said, okay, I'll buy half, and you buy half. And so the horse was $3,000, and I paid $1,500, which was not a real good investment. It's kind of like some of the multi-level deals I got in. But anyway, there are some multi-level deals that are good, but the ones I got in weren't. But anyway, uh, 
Oh, hallelujah. And I went out while we were training, while they were training that horse, and I watched the trainer. They didn't let me train him, and they didn't let the other owner train him. They, they trained this horse uh, in this barn at, around the outside of the barn. There was a space about as wide as from here to those chairs, and, and it went all the way around the barn. And that trainer would position me at one corner, and uh, he would position Brother Rome at the other corner, and um, he would give us a stick. And he would say, uh, now when you see the horse coming down the aisle... He said, uh, take that stick and rub it on this ribbed tin so it makes a lot of noise. And then start beating on the wall. And uh, at first when you do it, that horse couldn't handle it. It was too much. After a while, though, that horse learned to handle all of that. It was a part of the training to get that horse used to how, how to be a show horse. It was a, it was a, a saddlebred horse. It was a walking horse. Uh, um, it was a gated horse. That, that doesn't help most of you. But, uh, but anyway, that's what it was. And it's a big process to get a gated horse. Um, am I just getting in deeper and deeper here about the horses? Uh, the difference between a gated horse and an ungated horse is the ride. And a gated horse is like riding on top of, you know, just on, like this. But uh, an ungated horse is like riding like this. And so uh, I didn't ride any of them. I just, you know, bought him. Uh, wasn't a wise financial decision. Ended up. But uh, lost the horse and the money. But anyway. Uh, these cows had never been harnessed. I am simply trying to show you how dramatic, how stark the contrast is in this story. There was a cattle, two cows upon which had come no yoke. And then the next part of that verse says to tie the cows to the cart. You've got to understand, these cows had never been harnessed. But secondly, these cows had never been hooked to a cart. And it's a different thing to be hooked to a cart than just to be harnessed. To be harnessed is one thing, but then to be hooked to a cart is another learning process that takes a lot of time. How to pull in tandem, how, how a yoke fit across both of the cattle. And if those cattle did not learn how to walk in rhythm, then the yoke would not be easy, if you please. And it would wear big bloody spots that eventually could kill the cattle on their shoulders. And they'd get infected and on and on the story would go. They had to learn how to walk together in tandem. They had never had a mission before. They had never had purpose before. They had never been, it had never been laid upon them that, that their freewheeling days were over. And that doing anything they wanted was a thing of the past. They, uh, they had never known what it was to wear a harness and to chafe when you want to go your own way, but the harness restrained you. They had never known what it was to pull a load, uh, even an easy load, much less a heavy load. They were a people who did not know what it meant uh, to have all of these things to take place. Uh, they, were, they, were, they were cows, but, but you're going to see that the cows became more than just cows in the broader and the syn synthesis of the story. They were uh, animals on top of all of that. They were animals that had their cow, uh, their calves separated from them. The calves were put behind them. They're going that way. And the calves are put back here. And the calves are going this way. Uh, it created an unnatural separation for these cows. Uh, to do the purpose of moving the ark of God created an unnatural separation. To be able to do what they were asking them to do seemed to be a violation of animal rights. But you've got to understand that these cows were on a mission, if you please, for God. These cows were the bearers of the glory of God, typified by the Ark of the Covenant, back to God's people. And from them it would go to the world. Uh, to say that cows had a revelation is a strange uh, way, it sounds strange linguistically. But these cows had a revelation. God creates cows and God creates people. You say, how could God talk to a cow and a cow understand him? And you've got to kind of chuckle. At the same time, you've got to say, how could it be that we are human beings and God can talk to us and we can't hear him? And these cows somehow got a revelation of the urgency that comes upon a creature when the divine mandate of God rests upon them. These cows somehow understood that it was not unjust, nor was it unnatural 
when you had the insights that they had uh, to form such a radical commitment to their particular divine destiny that they would go straight away from that which naturally belonged to them and which they would seek after, that there's some kind of something in the Spirit that got a hold of those cows uh, that made them recognize uh, that there is a tearing loose uh, process that goes into bearing the ark of the Lord uh, to its destination that caused these cows. Let me read it again. And the cows went straight on the road. They went straight on the road. On the road to Beth Shemesh. On a single high road. Lowing as they went. Veering neither right nor left. They, they went straight on the high road. Veering neither right nor left. But there is dropped in there that little phrase, lowing as they went. There are some of the world's greatest scholars who have studied this passage of Scripture, and said, the lowliness they went does not fit in there. Why would the writer put that in there? Because the idea is simply to show to the Philistines that indeed God had divinely struck them because they had crossed the people of God. And they concluded that the writer just put it in there because it sounded good. And I'm not saying that the writer couldn't do that if he didn't want to, but that's not really why that's in there. It's not in there because it sounds good. It's in there because though these cows had a revelation of the urgency of the divine mandate, and though these cows had a radical commitment to that particular divine destiny that God had left for them, still they loved their babies. And the lowing as they went was the crying of their hearts that said, we know we're doing the divine will of God, but we feel pain. We feel pain in the process because we're still cows, and we still have feelings for our babies. And what they felt was, I don't know how else to describe it, I suppose it's what we call, they felt a biological pain, a pain that, that was there because of what it was costing them to do the will of God. It was a pain that was there because of what it was costing them to do the will of God. And the end of the cow story is verse 14. It tells us that when they finally got to their destination, the Israelites broke up the cart and made firewood out of it and killed the cows and offered them as a sacrifice. The cow's ultimate reward for doing the will of God was that they were sacrificed to the glory of God. And basically, that is the end of their stories. Now, i got to tell you that, frankly, when I read this story, um, I mean, I'm not, you know, much with animals. I don't know much about animals, but uh, my heart was touched by the commitment and the pain of these dumb animals. Somehow it seemed like that I could relate with that if I would look a little deeper or else back away and look a little broader. And so, so far, I have been giving you this story in the context of an analysis of the story, breaking it down further and further. But to get the fullness of this story, you have to look at it in the context of synthesis also. And when you see how it relates with other stories, you begin to see much more clearly how it relates with you and I. So we're going to take a look at it. This won't take long, but let me quickly tell you that in 1 Samuel, there's three stories. The story of Samuel, the story of David, the, uh, of Saul, the first king, and David, the second king. That's what the book of 1 Samuel is about. It tells about the coming of Samuel. It tells about the coming of Saul. And it tells about the coming of David. That's the whole, that's the completeness of what the book of 1 Samuel consists of. If you read the story of the cows, which ironically is found in the book of 1 Samuel, are you with me? Amen? Everybody said amen. If you read the story of 1 Samuel, uh, the story of the cows, it is found also in 1 Samuel. And it is found placed directly after the story of Samuel and directly before the stories of Saul and David. 
If you look a little closer, a little broader, rather, I should say, in the Bible, you will find that Samuel is the last of the judges. When you read your Bible, you've got the introductory period, and then you've got the Exodus, which talks about the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, and how they left there, and uh, then when they got into the Promised Land, they were ruled for about 380 years or so by judges. The, The book of Judges in the Bible is the book of these judges. That's how they were ruled. After you get through the book of Judges, Samuel was the last one of those. At the end of the book of Judges, as shown in 1 Samuel, the people said, we want a king. And Samuel is the transition judge. He's the one that moved from being judge to be introducing a king. And so you have the last of the judges in Samuel. And then you have the story of the cows. And then you have the introduction immediately after that of the first king, which is Saul. And then you have, right after that, the introduction of the second king, which is David. And then you have the end of the book of First Samuel. When you look at this, you begin to see that the story of both Samuel's birth and consecration to ministry closely parallels the story of the cows. You will also see that the story of Saul and his rise and the story of David and his ascendancy also parallels closely the story of the cows. Samuel parallels it most closely, but the others also parallel it. And what they show us is that the same uh, tension that is set up with the cows and their young in doing the will of God is the same tension that is set up for men and women who would do the will of God. And that the cows, in fact, become the basic story through which all of these other stories begin to make more sense. When you look at the story of Saul, we, we, I'm not going to preach about Saul this morning, except to give it in this context. There's a part of the story of Saul that we never emphasize. I don't think I've ever even heard it emphasized. And that is that when Saul was called of God, he was very close and very intimate with his family. You can see this in the Bible quite clearly. The Bible in chapter 9, all this is in 1 Samuel, verse 2, talks first in introducing Saul. It talks about his father, whose name was Kish. And it says, he was a mighty man of power. And Saul's immediately introduced as one that is tied to his dad. The Bible says of Kish, this is, quote, Kish had a son. And then it goes ahead and says, and his son was a choice young man. It doesn't just take Saul and put him out here by himself, but there's, there's clear connection, and I'll show you a little more of this as we go along here. There's clear connection between Saul and his daddy. That it was a close relationship cannot be doubted. The Bible says of Saul in that same verse that he was a goodly man. In fact, it goes further than that. It says, there was none goodlier in Israel. Well, people aren't goodly just because they're born out of their mother's womb. People who are goodly or comely are people that are trained. They're people that time has been taken with. They're people that someone has talked to them and taught them and loved them and cared for them. The first story you see about Saul in that same chapter is that his father's lost apparently a large herd of donkeys and can't find them. And so Saul goes to get those donkeys. When you read that story, it becomes clear that Saul is very conscientious. Just listen to the language. In verse 3 of chapter 9, it says, And the asses of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said to Saul, his son, Take now one of the servants with thee, and arise, go seek the asses. And he passed through. Now listen to all the places that Saul passed through. And he passed through Mount Ephraim, and through the land of Shalisha. And they found him not. And he went to Shalim, and found him not. And he passed through the land of Benjamin, and found him not. When he's come to the land of Zuck, Saul still had not found him. Notice, this boy's concerned about finding his father's donkeys. It's a, it's a relationship here where he feels like he's a partner with his father. There's a tightness and a security involved in this familial relationship. You read on down, uh, you find in verse 5 that after three days, Saul said uh, to his servant, we need to go home. We need to go home and check in with Dad, because Dad's going to be worried about us. Uh, 
a son that did not have a close relationship with his father would have no concern about that. He wouldn't care. He would just say, you know, oh, we'll just keep working until we find him. But apparently they had tight communication in their family, a communication that they were careful to keep going. And he was concerned for his father's feelings. Uh, in the meantime, Saul meets Samuel and eats with him. But even with all of that going on, if you go on down to verse 20 of chapter 9, you'll find that Saul is still worried about the, the donkeys because Samuel says to him, don't worry about the donkeys. They've been found. But even with the call of God uh, coming on his life, he still is concerned to maintain this relationship uh, with his father and mindful of his father's feelings. When you get into chapter 10, Saul goes back home and you got an uncle in verse 14 that says, where, where did you go, Saul? An uncle indicating that this tight family. The Bible says he was the uncle. The very next verse or two, he says, uh, well, what did Samuel say to you? It was a family that communicated. It was a family that was tight. It was a family that was close. So, however, I want to point out to you that after his coronation, Saul's family, other than his children, are no longer mentioned. Somehow they get left behind in the story. Somehow when Saul becomes mandated, somehow when, when, the, when the mantle of, of purpose and mission of God falls upon Saul, uh, these, these family relationships, somehow there's violence done to them, and, and somehow Saul can't get back to where he was before because it seems to launch him on, on an ocean of, 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 uh, of purpose uh, that does not have a reverse gear in the boat to get back home. This, this, man, um, this man, eventually, when you look in chapter 10, and we're going to take time, if you've got your Bible, you can look at it in chapter 10, verses 11 and 12. Uh, here, here's this man that's so close to his father. And now you read here, it came to pass, 10 and 11, when all that knew Saul before time saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets, then the people said one to another, What is this that is come unto the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? And verse twelve, and none of the and one of the same place answered and said, But who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, is Saul also among the prophets? Uh, uh, notice there it says, uh, But who is their father? What that is saying there, what that is saying there uh, is is that Saul was a man who was close to his father, who was a prominent man in Israel. But after he did the will of God, he ends up with prophets. And that verse is telling, and if you study it, you can find this out. This is not just a Wilsonism. That the prophets were known as people of questionable parentage. They were known because they were not tied to their homes. They were, they were not tied to all the, the accoutrements of security that all the other people were tied to. But the prophets had a certain wandering aspect about them. The prophets had a certain kind of, of uh, awkward uh, commitment about them that made people say it was a proverb, like, who is their father? Now, here's Saul, a man who had close ties to his home and to his family, who is now with the prophets. And the people are shocked that he's with the prophets because he is now a man that is like them. And people say, well, then who is his father? A people that seem to, that seem to, on the surface of it, abandon the natural pulls. Uh, right here, there's a scripture. It seems to just come out at me from Matthew. I think it's chapter 10, where Jesus said, "In a man's family, there'll be five, and three will be against two, and two will be against three, and a man's foes will be they of his own household." And and goes further than that, and 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 pardon the the the, the harshness of the language this morning. But Jesus even goes further than that and says, If a man hateth not his mother and his father and his brethren, and come and take up his cross and follow me, then he is not worthy of me. Such language, such language, such stories as I see of cows leaving their calves, lowing in pain, but nevertheless so drunken, if you please, on the purpose and mission that God has put in those dumb animals up that they leave it all behind to follow the Lord. When you talk about David, uh, David is a comely person. These are the three people of Samuel. Uh, first Samuel, Samuel, Saul, and David. When you talk about David, the story is no different. 16 and verse 7 says he's a comely person. Uh, how do you become comely? It didn't mean he's just good looking. 
although he probably was that too. But he was he he, he had trained. His family loved him. His family cared about him. When you look in chapter 16, verse 11, when Samuel's trying to find one of the boys to anoint to be king, he gives all the boys, but he's got David, if you please, hidden up on the hill. David's the baby. David's the, if you please, the favorite. David's hidden up on the hillside. And all the other boys have to go before Samuel. And Samuel actually has to stop and say, uh, Listen, Jesse, is this all your boys? And he says, No, this is not. This is not all my boys. I, I have one more up on the hillside. I can hear the lowing of the cattle when I hear Jesse say, uh, Yeah, I got one more. He's up on the hillside. And in his heart, he said, I don't want to bring him down. I, I know I'm an older man. I know a little bit about what happens when people are anointed. I, perhaps he knew the family of Saul. He knew, he knew Kish, perhaps. And Israel's not all that big. And, and, and he saw how this can how this can do damage to all the natural things that mean so much to us. And but 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 Jesse, do you have any more boys? God's anointing is not on any of these boys to be king. And you got one somewhere else. Yeah, I got one. Uh, okay, all right, man of God, I'll bring him down. And so down comes David, and 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 you know the story how that he is anointed to be king. And and um, and um, I don't really think Jesse was too happy about that. Because when you read a little later, the Bible says in chapter 17 that all of uh, Jesse's boys went to be in war. The three oldest boys went to war. But you just read another verse or two there and it says, but David is keeping his father's sheep. I can see this father as, 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 he, as, as he sees his boy, David, anointed. And, and there was three anointings to David, his brother Mahaney preached the other night, but this is the first one. It was anointing in front of his family. And, and after the anointing, David may have come to Jesse and said, what do I do now? And his father said, son, go back to where the sheep are. His father is, 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 is saying, go back, son, up to where the sheep are. But war breaks out, and the story of the Philistines and Goliath is the, is the war that the Bible is talking about. And, and finally, the father calls David down and says, look, your three older brothers in war, and I don't know how they're faring. Take a cart and go over there and see what is going on. And so David uh, takes a, a, a cart and goes to see what is going on. When he gets there, uh, the Bible says that the armies were preparing to face off with one another. And the Bible says that David shouted for the battle. And his older brother hears him shouting for the battle. And David looks around and says, who is this Philistine up here that's, that's causing trouble for everybody? And David maybe doesn't even know where his courage comes from, but he's the anointed of God. This boy, this boy that's never had the harness before, there's something that happened to him when that oil was poured over his head. He doesn't even understand what's driving him to say, who is this? uncircumcised Philistine. He doesn't even understand how all of this could be. But it's so deep in him that he stands up and forgets about his own life and says, Who is this Philistine that is standing up? And his older brother comes to him. Uh, most of the time when we preach it, we preach it that his older brother is saying to him, David, David, look, you're just a pipsqueak. Quit. We don't want you in here getting hurt. Uh, uh, you don't know what you're doing and chastising him. But the truth is, is that it was an older brother. When you read it closely, it becomes a little clearer, I believe, that the older brother was, was, was concerned about his little brother. That the older brother knew the size of Goliath. Uh, the older brother understood the stakes were high and that it was life or death. And it's not like up there shooting rocks at a target, boy. You don't understand what's going on here. It's a, it's a, it's a bloody thing that's happening here. David, come on, son. You're, you're acting, you're acting, uh, uh imprudent. Get out of here. Get, get your cart and get on home. Dad's going to be mad if I let you get in trouble here. Everybody in the family protects David. Everybody takes care of him. He's protected by his brothers and he doesn't go to war. And then he's protected by his brothers and he's sent home from war. And get him back out there on the side of the hill. But somewhere along there, David gets his 
anointing. And, and he ends up taking care of Goliath. Uh, and when the anointing is there, oh God help us, you can't just stay up somewhere tending the sheep. You'd like to, you'd like to, but you can't do that. It, it just... It, just doesn't happen for people that have the anointing upon them. They they can't stay at home and just nurse the babies. Uh, there's something there's something that that is more that gets a hold of them that is very difficult to describe. Uh, and David becomes prominent, and 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 the women of Israel sing and say, Saul has slain his thousands, uh, but David has slain his tens of thousands. Uh, and jealousy comes into Saul's heart, uh, and he begins to track David. Uh, and uh, and David uh, is playing his heart for him one day. This happened twice. Uh, and while David is playing his harp, uh, 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 the jealousy of Saul comes on him. Uh, and while David has got his eyes about half closed, uh, and he's playing beautiful music, uh, Saul gets off his throne, and uh, his his eyes are, are are bloodshot and red, and and the veins uh, pump blood out on his neck, and and he raises up with his spear, and he and he. Cast his javelin uh, at David. Uh, and David, while he's playing there, hears the rustle and looks up and sees it coming, moves aside, and the javelin sticks in the wall and trembles there as David makes his way out of the room. More than once it happened. And now the purpose and call of God on this comely lad that daddy loved and brothers protected uh, has put him in a position that's life-threatening. Uh, I don't have time to read to you uh, all the verses in even one chapter where David is now tracked. Uh, let me just give Give them to you. In chapter 18, 5 through 9, David is tracked. In chapter 18, 10 through 11, they try to kill him. In chapter 18, verse 25 is another attempt to kill him. In chapter 18, 28, 29 is another attempt to kill him. In chapter 19 and 1 is another attempt to kill him. In chapter 19, 8, 9 and 10 is another attempt to kill him. In chapter 19, verse 11 is another attempt to kill him. In chapter 19, verse 20 is another attempt to kill him. In chapter 19, verse 21 is another attempt to kill him. Him. In chapter 19, verse 21, uh, 22 is another attempt to kill him. In chapter 20, verse 1 is another attempt to kill him. What do you think his dad's doing all this time? How do you think his family's feeling about this? Uh, how do you think David's feeling about this? Uh, but the tracks upon him. And, and finally, look what he's reduced to. Uh, if you've got your Bible, look in chapter 21. Here's what David is reduced to just to survive, just to live. This is what he's finally reduced to. In verse 10 of chapter 21. And David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul, and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said unto the king, Is not this David, the king of the land? Did they not sing one to another of him in dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands? And David laid up these words in his heart. And was sore afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. In other words, they recognized who he was. And they were going to kill him, he was afraid. Notice what he did. And he changed his behavior before them. And feigned himself mad in their hands. And scrabbled on the doors of the gate. And let his spittle fall down upon his beard. Then said Achis unto his servants, Lo, ye see the man is mad. Wherefore then have ye brought him to me? Have I need of mad men that ye have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? Uh, here's David. This is the, this is, he's at the bottom of the barrel. He's run through all of the verses that I just previously read to you, the verse numbers. Uh, and he's been, they tried to kill him in all these different ways. Uh, Saul's tried to get his men to kill him. Saul sent him out and said, I'll give you my daughter if you'll kill a hundred Philistines. Because he thinks that a hundred Philistines are killing him. David goes out and kills two hundred Philistines. Uh, and brings the foreskins back. Uh, and gets Michael, which is Saul's daughter. And she loves him. And Michael sees that David's going to be killed. And sends him away. And Saul says, why is my own daughter turned against me? And she says, David, David, she, she lied. She said, David said he didn't want to kill me. Therefore, to, to, to warn him and... And so I did. Uh, and Jonathan uh, 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 tries to help David. Uh, and now David is finally at the end of the road uh, until there's nowhere else to go. What is he doing? He's trying to fulfill the purpose of God. Uh, and now he's went over to Achish, a heathen king. He has nowhere else to go. They recognize him. And so David acts like a crazy man. Uh, and he dribbles spit out of his mouth. Uh, and he scrabbles on the doors. Uh, and acts like a crazy man because it's his last resort. Uh, how 
How has the will of God brought a man who's going to write beautiful psalms uh, from a home of a respected man, Jesse, who is a who is a descendant of Ruth in the beautiful story of Naomi and Ruth? Uh, how has God's will and God's purpose and God's mission brought a man to the point that he's feigning insanity just to survive? Uh, and he has no friends left around him. And he has no loved ones around him. I will tell you that when David was laying in H's, uh, there was in him the lowing of the cows. What am I doing here, God? I thought you anointed me to live in a beautiful palace, God. And I'll tell you something I never noticed before, to be honest with you, until I got a little deeper in this story. Look at chapter 22 and verse 1. David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave Agilum. He left acting crazy. Ran to a cave. Notice this next line. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. Now this defines the condition of his family at this point. And everyone that was in distress, and everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented, gathered themselves unto him. Here's David. His family has been a great family. I've just traced some of the lineage for you. And, and, and you know that we could do a lot more about David, the greatness of his family, the dynasty. But here he is. Him obeying the call of God has drug his whole family from the lofty post of esteem in Israel. Until now, they're numbered with those in distress and those in debt and those discontent. And they have nowhere to go. Apparently, they've lost the ranch. And they've lost all the things that they have because they're now numbered with the distressed, the in debt, the discontent. And his whole father's house comes to him. They could have said, David, look what you've caused in our house. Son, we're going to come and get rid of you. You're a trouble-causing kid. But somehow his family, though they apparently had lost everything at this point, understood the lowing of the cows and said, It hurts, David. It hurts so bad. But we know that we're moving the ark of God to where it's supposed to go. There's a strong sense in these stories that divine election is an exacting and seemingly cruel destiny that involves doing violence to the most intimate biological bonds. And that there's a sense in these stories that human submission to the aims of God exacts a terrible price, tearing through the ligatures that bind parent and child, displacing people, moving them from all of the natural, how would you say it, organic relations. Biological connections because of the sobering array of challenges and terrorizing possibilities. So, Brother Wilson, what are you doing this morning? I'm just preaching the Bible to you. But I'm also talking to you about a scriptural model of the cows. And the purpose and mission of God getting a hold of them. When you preach this way, not always, but sometimes, you have someone who hears the preaching. Who is not cognizant of the ways of God. And so when they leave, and you may be here today. They say, 
Well, I would never cause my family to have to have that radical of a devotion to anything. I had a man come to the church, a beautiful family, way back when I was in Flint, Michigan. He was a fine man. I was so impressed with him, his good spirit. In the church there, we, we told him, we said, you know, television is not good for your children. Let's all just dump them. And they did. And we did. And uh, this man came for a while, and eventually I noticed him missing some. Finally, he came to church one night, and I caught him. I said, Brother, hey, I've been missing you some. What's up? Oh, everything's okay. Time went on. Finally, I caught him again. I said, I noticed you don't come to our church anymore. What's happening? He said, Well, Brother Wilson, I love the church. I love the people. But I love my family. I just don't want my kids to be raised underprivileged by not having the television. I don't want them to be raised ignorant. I don't want them to be raised with prohibitions that I don't feel like they need. And I know you're not going to change, so I decided I would change. I told you that the book of 1 Samuel is a story about Samuel and Saul and David. I started to add one more man because there's one more man mentioned in this story prominently in the early part of it. And he's Eli, the priest that raised Samuel. But Eli did not, did not submit his children to the will of God. I want to take just a moment to read. If you have your Bible, I'm in chapter 2, verse 29. And read the alternatives to committing our families to God. This is God talking to Eli, rebuking him. Verse 29, Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation? He kicked at the sacrifice. And honorest thy sons above me. I see Jesse again saying, I don't want to bring my youngest boy down. I don't want him anointed to do that. God here saying to Eli, Why do you kick at my sacrifice, my offering, and honor us thy sons above me? To make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Wherefore the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now, the Lord saith, be it far from me. For them that honor me I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Listen to these tragic verses. Behold, the day is come that I will cut off thine arm, and the arm of thy father's house, that there shall not be an old man in thine house. And thou shalt see an enemy in my habitation, in all the wealth which God shall give Israel. And there shall not be an old man in thine house forever. And the man of thine whom I shall not cut off from mine altar shall be to consume thine eyes and to grieve thine heart. And all the increase of thine house shall die in the flower of their age. And this shall be a sign unto thee that shall come upon thy two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. In one day they shall die, both of them. And I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in my heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house. And he shall walk before mine anointed forever. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left in thine house shall come and crouch to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread. And shall say, Put me, I pray thee, into one of the priest offices that I may eat a piece of bread. 
here's a man that didn't make the radical commitment because it seemed too radical to stop his sons. Correct them. It was too painful to lay them on the altar to that degree. But I hear the lowing of the cows. If cows can weep as their, as their cow spirit weeps in pain, but they have a revelation that this is best. I'm going to close with the last story, which is the story of Samuel. Actually, in the Bible, you have the story of Samuel, then the story of the cows, then the story of Saul, then the story of David. I've given you the story of the cows, and then I went ahead and showed you how the story of the cows foretold the tearing of the family that was not committed, that, that didn't understand it all with Saul and with David. Now let's go back, and in closing, we'll talk about Samuel. The story of Samuel starts with the story of a woman named Hannah, who is Samuel's mother. But she doesn't have Samuel at the time. In fact, she has no children. And her husband has two wives, and the other wife has lots of children. And she taunts her and belittles her. Because she's barren. But Hannah doesn't want to be barren. And so when it's time to go to Jerusalem, they go. And her husband loves her very much. And they go to Jerusalem. And when the others are eating, she slips off and goes to the temple. And not Jerusalem, Shiloh. And while they are in the temple at Shiloh, she kneels by a pillar. And there's a seat over here that Eli is sitting on. He's the priest. And she kneels there. And the Bible says, Hannah, in her prayer, and I'm quoting, spake in her heart, only her lips moved. I hear the lowing of the cows. And she prayed in such a way that the priest came over and thought she was drunk because she was in such a stupor of focus, such a radical pressing for the purposes of God. And he kind of nudges her and says, Woman, get up. You shouldn't be drunk in the temple. She looks up at Eli and she says, Your Honor, I'm not drunk. I am praying. Because I want a son. And she prays and says, God, if you'll give me this son, I will give this son to you. Eli, when it dawns on him what's happening, he says, All right, arise, woman. Says, God grant your request. God give you what you've requested today. She goes back outside, gets with her husband, and goes home. When she goes home, she becomes expectant with a child, a baby boy. In her prayer, she said, God, if you give me the baby, I'll give the baby to you. You know, I want to preach this part of this message at every baby dedication, but you can't do that. There's too many things going on. And for some of you, it would just become redundant. That's really what a baby dedication was meant to be. This is your baby God. And her husband gets ready to go up to Jeru- up to Shiloh for the annual trek, where they sacrifice to the Lord every year. He tells everybody to get ready, let's go. But Hannah looks at her husband and says. Honey, I don't want to go this year. She said, would you just let me stay home with my baby while I nurse him? And then when he gets a little older, I will go back to the temple. And I will take him there and leave him there. 
Okay, honey, that's fine. For three years or so, they go without her. And she nurses her baby. I don't know how many connections you can make with the cows nursing their calves. In fact, she nurses him until he is a a, a na'er, a, in the Hebrew, a lad, probably three and a half years, four years old. Why would a woman nurse a child? How could this be so long? I think she knows. I want to love this little boy. I want to pour my love on this little boy. Because I hear the lowing of the cows. The purposes of God are going to create a feeling of violation of biological attachments. I want to love my little boy. And finally, when he's about four years old, she takes him. To the temple, to the sanctuary. The writer, the biblical writer, as I have told you earlier, adheres to the general way they do things, the general norm of, of impassiveness, impassivity. The writer doesn't talk about what her heart was feeling as she made her way. The writer doesn't tell us anything directly of Hannah's feelings in this freely accepted separation from her firstborn. It's her baby. And she's taking him. It's her only baby at this point. And she's taking him to Jerusalem. And this little boy is taken in She says to Eli, I have given him to the Lord. Your English Bible says lent him to the Lord, but the original says it means I have given him over to the Lord. He belongs to God once and for all. What did that mother feel like when her baby... Where's where's Boston? Is he awake? Honey? What did that mother feel like? Knowing that little boy didn't know this one's four years old. That's about what Samuel was. That little boy didn't know what was going on. He didn't understand that his mama that he loved so much. To him, it was, to him it was funny. And I believe she looked at him and said, Honey, I love you so much. You're so precious to me. But inside she was saying, But you'll never be back to my house. I believe she said, take my hand, bud. I love you. And she walked him in. He didn't know. He just having fun. But she knew. She knew that when she put him in the hands of Eli, that he would never be home again. The Bible says only two more things about Samuel as a little boy. It says, in the house of God, he wore an ephod. You know what an ephod is? It's kind of like a tunic. No sleeves. 
but it's longer. A tunic would cut off twice. It comes on down like about like a coat would, <laughs> but it's pulled over. And virtually nobody in Israel ever wore ephods except priests. And here's this little boy. When she comes back to see him year after year, she sees her little boy in a priest outfit. There's never been a little boy in a priest outfit in the history of Israel. And this little boy comes to her. Hi, Mom. Hi, Samuel. And she hugs him. I just can only imagine how her heart must have bursted within her. There was a part of her that sang a song, it's in the Bible, that God has elevated me by giving to me this boy. There's a part of her that went straight to the will of God. But there's a part of her that was lowing and saying, this is going to cost me something, but it's worth it. <coughs> That's what I call a refined revelation. You know why I don't preach like this very often in this church? Because not many people can even handle it. You'll leave and say, my God, that's too strong. That's too... We need to be more reasonable. But this woman had a refined revelation. She understood things that... Can I tell you that while I was studying this, this week on the airplane... closed my eyes. I had a window seat and I was just gently rocking back and forth in the seat. I'll confess to you that tears were in my eyes as I thought about this little boy. And I said, oh God, what, what a woman. And right then, right then behind me there was a woman sitting I'd seen her and her male friend get on the plane. They were business people. She was dressed in business clothes and business attire and makeup and all that. And I picked up on their conversation right then, right while I was thinking about where we're at in this message. And she was complaining about something in the business that they were in. I don't know what business it was, but she was saying, when I get in the next business session, too, I'm going to be bringing this up. And -and so-and-so, when she was in my office, she said that. And she clanged against my image of another woman named Hannah. Who knew things that this businesswoman will never know in a million, million, million years? About the things of a refined revelation of what really counts in this world. And what really matters.